Um, and Gina, I am so excited to talk to you because I loved the movie so much. I'm going to be honest, I'm a huge fan of the Old Guard comic because um, it's an amazing comic. And I was, you know, like, is this movie going to live up to it? I don't know. And I fell in love with the movie because it has such an undercurrent of loneliness, which I really connected to right now. And I think <laughs> a lot of people will, uh, considering what's going on in the state of the world. But I was curious for you, what attracted you originally to this material? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, foremost, I was, I mean, crazy excited that it got sent to me. Uh, Skydance sent it and they had the rights to it. And they do really big, good films. And uh, so I knew that this had to be something special. And uh, I'd been familiar with Greg Rucka's work. Um, love Lazarus. I love what he does with female characters, but I didn't know about the old guard. So I was reading it fresh, which I'm, I'm happy about because the story just kept surprising me. And uh, I just fell in love with these characters. Love the fact that there were two women at the heart of it. Love the fact that one is a young black female hero. Love Nikki and Joe. It just felt like this cool collection of, of you know, warriors from different cultures and backgrounds and sexual orientations and genders that have come together to save the world. And it just felt like the world that I wanted to see um, and love the action. But also prior to doing this movie, prior to reading the script, I absolutely used to think that, that I wanted to live forever. Um, I thought like what that, the courage that that would give you if you knew you couldn't die. And mm. in reading it, suddenly I understood the tragedy of immortality, which is absolutely, you know, a, a big theme of this. And, and I loved that. I loved that it felt very truthful and real and authentic to this fantastical conceit. And I really leaned into that as opposed to the aspirational aspects of of being immortal which i feel a lot of superhero movies are mm. that actually brings up a question i didn't have written down but i was curious to ask you because a lot of people are calling it a superhero movie but i like didn't really look at it like that do you consider it super in the superhero genre so to speak i guess you know i say i feel it's more I say it's based on a comic book and based on a graphic novel. I mean, they do, the superhero quality, of course, comes from them being immortal, but I love that they're mostly immortal, um, yeah. which I feel, you know, gives it a, a, a different flavor um, in that there's not an invincibility um, that I think most su superhero films have. Mm, no, that makes a lot of sense. We actually have a really good question from Tracy Charlton that I think we should answer, and she asks, or they asked, at what point did Charlie Theron get involved with the old guard? Did she have any input on developing the script? Is she, so uh, as I said, it started at Skydance and Skydance had been developing the script with Greg Rucka for about a year uh, mm -hmm. before I came on. So, um, you know, when I got the script, it was really good. And then I came aboard and then continued to work on the script with Greg Rucka and you know, there were a couple things that I wanted to do with it. And, uh, and so we dove into it. And at that point, um, in taking it to Netflix, then it was time to cast. And, uh, you know, I knew I wanted the best actors for every role because I wanted it to, you know, feel grounded and real and felt like I just wanted dope performances. I mean, everybody does, but you know, <laughs> I, I really wanted uh, just great actors. And so at that point, uh, we thought Charlize, given that she's so good as an actor, but also knew that given her work in Mad Max, which is a phenomenal movie, George Miller, um, and Atomic Blonde, that we could trust that she could do the action and knew what it would take to embody this character, Andy, who knows every single fighting style known to man. Yeah, let's talk about the action. There's lots of close quarters action. Some of the best moments in the film are action sequences, and there's like a beauty to them where you can see a lot of character traits intrinsic to these people and how they fight. Was that something you were cognizant of doing and shaping the action? And what sort of action were you going for in the process of making this film? Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I love action films. I see everything. And so you start to develop, you know, what do you like and what do you don't like? And um, for me, the best action sequences are 
character driven. They have a story to them, a beginning, middle, and end, and they're emotional. And so that's what I wanted for these. I wanted each action set piece to feel different, and they would because each had a different story to them. Um, I wanted them to feel grounded and real. Um, again, given this this fantastical conceit, I still wanted you to feel like these are real characters, real people could who could be sitting next to you at a Starbucks. So mm. um, that had to permeate everything, and especially the action. So um, it started with um, an incredible, incredible stunt team, Jeff Haberstad and Danny Hernandez, who designed the fights and Bryson Counts, the conversations that we had. And I talked about um, the story of each fight. Um, you know, take, take the plane fight, for example, that, you know, what is the story of that? It, it's two women. Um, one, Niall is completely freaked out. She's pissed off. She's been shot in the head. You know, she wants to get free. Um, and then you have Andy who has pulled in this new immortal and she's testing her. What does this new person have? What is she going to bring to the team? Um, and also the two different fighting styles. Niall is a Marine, so she learned a specific martial art um, that they teach, whereas Andy knows every fighting style known to man. So what is that going to feel like clashing? And then as, as, the, as they start to come at each other and Niall can't even touch her, um, because Andy's just playing with her. Um, I just wanted to see that the, um, I just wanted to see Niall get stripped away and, and kind of throw out her military training and just start throwing, you know, bows at, at Andy and uh, finally clocks her and gets that slip in. And you see the respect in that moment that Andy has for her. Niall gets her swagger back and <laughs> wanted to, to keep shifting um, but was, what was so important about the scene also was to reveal who Niall was. She kept coming. She was mm. getting humiliated. She was getting rocked, but she kept coming. And that said so much about her, not only to Andy, but to the audience as well. So when you start with that as a story, that allows, you know, the team to design the fight. And then at that point, how do I want to shoot it? And, um, you know, that's, that's a whole, whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm <clears throat> actually curious to ask about the Niall character because she's very fleshed out in the movie and she's full of surprises and it's nice to watch something that you know what the work is it's based on and be like genuinely surprised by turns the film makes. So there's a few turns I definitely am going to ask you about. But yeah. one thing I wanted to talk about was the crafting of the Niall character. Um, Greg Rucker was interviewed at Vulture by Oliver Sava about how the second draft was the Nile draft and really digging into her character. And he talks a little bit about how, you know, you were instrumental in, in making sure she was crafted the right way. Can you talk about crafting Nile and maybe a little bit about what sort of holes she fills in action films and supernatural films? I mean, this is, this is the thing that, um why I was so happy to be in the director's chair and why it's so important that more of us are in that director's chair and in that position. Um, somebody, and I had never thought of it before, literally in, in the press that I've been doing, somebody asked me about my black female gaze and I hadn't thought about that before, but it's true, that is what I bring to every film. And what that means is I, what do I elevate? What do I find important to put my camera on to show to the audience um, to dictate what you think in that moment. And for me in reading the script, and again, Greg wrote a dope draft and a dope character, um, but she still needed more backstory. She still needed a more fuller arc. I really wanted to elevate the story uh, with her and her family. I wanted to elevate the fact, I felt Niall grew up in the church. I thought that that would be an important element to her. The fact that you know her father was a Marine uh, and she followed in his footsteps. Um, and uh, yeah, just giving her more agency in the climax and, and you know, in the plot overall. It was something that I recognized was missing. Um, and I think I recognize it because I was reading a character that reminded me of me. So um, mm -hmm. that's why, again, it's so important that we are everywhere um, to recognize those things because oftentimes certainly for black characters in the genre, sometimes you wonder why, why do they have no black friends or, or no family mm -hmm. or they don't date anybody black? Um, why do they just disappear from the story? Why do they pop in for a joke? Um, you know, why aren't they 
really crucial to the climax of the film. And you see that with female characters as well, you know, in being the sidekick or the side piece um, or not really being involved um, in the main action. So um, it, it's again, so important that we are in, in those positions of power to recognize that and rectify it. So um, that was great to be able to dig in with Greg. And the great thing about Greg is he recognized it as well and was mm -hmm. eager um, to build up Nile more. Definitely, and I think you guys did a really good job on that. Um, I think you bring up something that has been on my mind lately. It wasn't actually something I wrote down originally, but do you think Hollywood is genuinely changing for the better when it comes to both representation and seeing more people of color and people of different backgrounds also behind the scenes? Um, I, I can say it's getting better. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the numbers and you're like, damn, you know, these yeah. numbers that, that the WBA just put out for 2019 and the fact that, you know, in terms of films written by black women was 4%, 80% was white men, which means that, you know, what people see from our characters is from a, someone else's lens and not always authentic or truthful. So Again, it's always, I'm so excited by so many of these dope um, filmmakers coming out um, and making new interesting stuff. And mm. I just want to keep encouraging that. I do feel absolutely in the last couple of weeks during this national reckoning, Hollywood has, at least my bubble of Hollywood, has absolutely started to acknowledge their complicity in mm. the images that they've put out in addition to the invisibility uh certainly of black women that that they've contributed to and like they're coming to me open wide open mm. and first time not being defensive when i call them on the things that are wrong the fact that i can go to your office and walk from you know, the guest area all the way to your office and not pass one black person and often not one person of color. That's, that's wrong. How is that possible in 2020? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big one. And uh, I've talked to um, a company who in the last couple of weeks decided with two of their films um, to change the race of the main characters to, to make them people of color. That, that's, definitive concrete change. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really fascinating to hear. Also, love the love and basketball. Is that a cutout um, behind you? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. Um, one thing I really wanted to talk about with the film to kind of change gears a little bit is that, you know, the look of the comic is quite colorful and really plays with strong silhouettes but the look of the movie is very different and even communicates action differently. It has a raw look, it's a little dirtier, it's a little grimier, it's a little more human. Can you talk about crafting the look of the movie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, as soon as I read it, that, that's, as soon as I read the script, then I went to go read the graphic novel. And yeah, it pops, you know, and it's fun to read. And seriously, as I was reading the graphic novel, then, you know, once I got the gig, I was like, damn, how am I supposed to? am I supposed to do this? Um, but then I was so clear that I wanted it to feel grounded and real. I wanted you to believe that these people were in the world and they were real and that the emotions that they were struggling with, um, that, that loss of purpose and, and trying to figure out why they are here, um, that, that just felt so human to me and real to me. So I never wanted to take you out of that. So, um, um, Tammy Riker, uh, one of the, the DPs, helped me develop the look of it. And, and we really talked about two phrases, intimately epic, um, mm -hmm. given that this film is so much about the relationships between these different characters, yet it's really big in scope. And so wanting both of those, but that's where the, the handheld really came in, the focus on details, which can tell so much um, when you're not just on the faces, but the environment, what the body is doing. Um, I love just picking up those kind of things. Um, but again, getting great scope and, and being able to go to these different countries to shoot and so that we're not trying to, you know, create Mor Morocco on the back lot of something and only be able to shoot, you know, this much. Um, 
And then we also, the other phrase was pretty gritty. And mm -hmm. that for me is I wanted it to have a realistic look, but just, you know, a pop higher than that. So, you know, to make an alleyway, um, which is typically kind of gritty and grimy, but make it look beautiful. Um, so that, that opening shot of, of Andy walking through the alleys, I love the look of that. Um, and, you know, it was a way to, again, touch on the conceit that, that we were doing a comic book film, but never hopefully take us out of the reality. Um, mm -hmm. We used 65 millimeter cameras. Um, I'd seen Beale Street very recently um, when I was preparing for this. I love the look of that film. Mm -hmm. And I wanted that beauty for this. The 65 though, people hadn't used them in an action film before because mm -hmm. the cameras are really, really heavy. Um, and so to, to do action with it, I think it's 23 pounds. Um, wow. But we were like, let's go for it. We wanted to have the specific look um, and props to our camera guys who uh, they got massages every week, but they, they did it. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just wanted it to have a, a cool, interesting look, but the use of silhouette was something that I wanted to use as my homage to the graphic mm -hmm. novel. And that's um, really shown in, in the kill floor. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely use a lot of silhouette, but silhouette, silhouette is beautiful, you know. So definitely a, a violent scene. Yet I'm trying to find the beauty within that. So that was really kind of the theme that permeated um, my vision for the look. Yeah, and a lot of the fight scenes almost feel like ballet. With watching how like they know each other so well, they're able to like hand each other off weapons and like move around each other in like a very graceful, beautiful way. And I really uh, love that. Uh, about the movie. One question I wanted to ask that is something that I, I touched on before was that, you know, there is a really strong undercurrent in Charlize Theron's performance of loneliness and sorrow. And we get a little backstory to understand why that is. But mm -hmm. I was wondering if, you, you know, in helping her craft the performance, was that something you were very cognizant of as a director? Yeah, I mean, I as soon as I started reading Andy on the page, I did, I just, I love the, the, the loneliness. I love the sorrow within her. Um, I love that she was lost. I love that she was at a point where she just wanted it to stop. She'd been fighting for so long. And at the point where she is seeing that she's not making a difference and just wants it to end. It just, it was so visceral to me. And, uh, and I know that that's one of the things that Charlize connected with as well. And, you know, it's, it's hard though, you know, how, you can't play an age. Andy is 6,000 years old, <laughs> but you know, you can't play that. But what you can play is the exhaustion of that and, and mm. really tapping into, you know, real things that you're going through. Um, and that was, that was something that was really cool about her performance. Oh, definitely. Uh, there's a question from Andrea Lopez that I want to answer live. That's a really good one. Uh, she says, I'm excited about the fact that the movie left romance for the male characters and women are the ones who face the action. It has always been the other way around in this profession. Was this a conscious decision and was this a creative choice that was easily taken by the studio? Mm -hmm. it, it was, that was in the graphic novel. Um, and thusly, since Greg adapted it, the script, and it was one of the things, again, I fell in love with. I love love stories. And I was so glad that, that this muscular film had a love story weaved in, and it just felt different. It felt like a love story we, we hadn't had an opportunity to see in the genre. So I embraced it. Um, Skydance absolutely embraced it. And the, you know, the cool thing is Greg, you know, there were a lot of people vying for this property and, and mm. with Skydance, took it on, Greg made them promise not to lose that scene in the armored car. And when they told me that, it was like, there's no way I'm losing that scene. That speech, I, I you know, I think everybody wants their significant other to say something like that to them. Oh, um, wish. that's crazy. <laughs> like somebody say that to me, please. Like that was hot. I loved that and romantic. It was beautiful. So and the actors, man. I mean, they just so embraced those characters. Marwan could not wait to say that speech. Luca couldn't wait to receive that speech. And, and so their passion for, for telling that story, passion for that moment was inspiring to me as a director. And uh, I just remember it was really kind of amazing that day on set um, because again, there was build up to it because you know the actors and I, we really wanted to get it right. And you can have it one way in your mind, but once you get on set, 
you know, you never know. And um, it was 13 takes. Mm. And uh, both Marwan and I knew immediately which one it was. And uh, what was beautiful is the next day, my editor, Terry Shropshire, you know, watches dailies every day. And then she calls me every morning to tell me if I messed up or if I did good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she called and she said, oh my God. And then she said the exact same take oh, that, wow. uh, that both Marwan and I love. But I remember after we were finished, um, two different guys on the crew came up to me and said, and they seemed a little confused, but they were, they were like, I just, I feel like I just watched two people in love. It didn't, it wasn't clicking to them that it was two men. It was just two people in love. And, and that's what I love so much about it, the normalcy of it. Um, and uh, thankfully audiences have embraced it. Yeah, definitely. I've seen a lot of Nikki and Joe fan art. So <laughs> it's so cool. That. There is that. Um, that actually leads me to my next question. You know, I really love the Nikki and Joe dynamic. I also loved Andy's backstory um, with Quinn, which wasn't like obviously explicitly queer, but there's, there's a bond there that I was really interested in. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you can talk about the romantic dimensions of the old guard, because that's one of the most surprising aspects of the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of each individual one or? Yeah, each individual one or just in general the film because I think it has a strong heart to it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, Nikki and Joe are, are, are certainly obvious and, and it's a love that has been spanned over a thousand years and the fact that they met during the Crusades on opposite sides and kept killing each other um, and then realizing, wow, this person isn't dying and realizing this person is my soulmate um, Booker and Andy are really interesting um, because, you know, there's an underlying feeling, at least for me and I know for Matthias, that at one point there was some love there on, from Booker's side, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't reciprocated. Um, but regardless of that, their friendship was, you can't even call it a friendship, you know, because it just goes so deep. It's hundreds of years and they rely on each other and they're with each other and they move through the world um, with each other. So there was just such a deep affection between those two and they understood each other because of that connective loneliness. Um, I love that they never hooked up though. That was something that was really important. I never wanted to really play that with those two characters. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the, well, I was about to say like Harry Met Sally, can, can two man and a woman be friends, but then they ended up getting together. So. Yeah, forget that. Um, <laughs> but they had such a deep friendship and I wanted it to stay there. Um, Quinn and Andy, honestly, was the same thing. It was just such a deep um, soul connection between the two. They were amazing friends for a couple thousand years. They were the, you know, really the first two of their kind that, that found each other. And that meant so much to the two of them. So, um, you know, there was, it was never, it was never intended to have a sexual element to it at all. It was just a soul connection, um, which was slightly different than, of course, Nikki and Joe. Um, it is interesting given there was something I had to cut out of the movie because of time and, and the way I wanted to ultimately fashion the, the flashbacks and the story of Quinn, um, which did talk about um, Quinn was with Lycon. Those two were soulmates. Mm. Um, and Lycon played by Michael Ward, who's such a good young actor. I love him so much. And, and that was really hard to pull some of his stuff out. Um, but they, they had that deep guttural love between the two. Um, and he was the first immortal who, who died. And, um, and so that continued to connect Andy and Quinn. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else cut out of the movie that you were sad to see let go? Well, out of the script, we didn't end up shooting it. It was in the script and, and I knew as much as I loved it that I would, we couldn't shoot it uh, on our schedule. And so honestly, the, the story, it had, you know, it has to have a focus. And we decided with the majority of flashbacks would be tied to Andy's character. But in the original script, as in the graphic novel, you get to see Joe and Nikki and that sequence of them during the Crusades killing each other over and over. Uh, it was, it's pretty epic. And uh, so I wish I could have shot that. Yeah, that would have been really cool. But 
I mean, the movie ends in a way that seems primed for a sequel setup. Can you see the old guard continuing? Um, I mean, this this has always been envisioned for Greg Rucka, who, you know, his comic books, um, all, he always envisioned as a trilogy. And actually the whole mm -hmm. second installment just uh, came out, I think, yesterday, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, so I, trust me, I'm, he's told me where the story goes and it's pretty amazing, but I'm actually going to actually call him up and <laughs> tell him to send it to me because I want to read it. Um, so he has always envisioned that. I know where the story goes. There's, there is a lot of story to tell. So, you know, I've been saying if the audience wants it, there's certainly more to tell. And it's been really beautiful to, to see that people want more. It means that we did our job with this first one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I'm in love with it. I know several people who are too, and including a lot of people who are asking questions. So since we're about halfway through, I'm going to pull out some more questions from the audience. Uh, Elizabeth Carr says, first off, Old Guard rocks. That's very true. Uh, it was an action movie with heart and soul. Would love to hear your approach to infusing an action film with such depth of character. Thank you very much for that. Um, that was the exciting thing about getting this job. Um, obviously, we know very few women get this opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. Hollywood sucks in that respect. Um, but this year was going to be, is, sorry, not was, is going to be a watershed, um, given that there's six of these big films being directed by women uh, coming out this year. Um, but with Skydance, when I got into that room to sit down and, and talk uh, about my vision and, and why I felt I was the right person to do this, you know, one of the first things they said was I was in there because they love Love and Basketball and Beyond the Lights mm -hmm. and loved the the character work and the depth of story that, that I did in those and they wanted that for Old Guard. So to hear that was amazing because so often we don't even get in the room because they say, oh, she has no action on her resume. Yet it wasn't the action or lack of action uh, mm -hmm. that got me in the room. So. I mean, what I loved about the story so much was the characters and, and part of my pitch was that the quiet moments were as important as the big action set pieces. We have to care about the, char the characters um, and the group as a whole and what they're struggling with or the action doesn't really matter. So um, it was really that paying the exact amount of attention to both and make sure that I tell a good story first and that the action then furthers the furthers the story as opposed to story, just rushing through story to get to the next set piece. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a discipline certainly, but I was grateful and thankful that Skydance wanted that exact same thing. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, we have a question from Kimberly Allen. They ask, as a director, did you find the genre switching jarring as in the old guard versus love and basketball, for example? Um, no, the, uh, because regardless of whatever genre you're doing, you still have to tell a story, mm -hmm. um, regardless of the budget, you still have to tell the story. And that, that was actually amazing advice. Ryan Johnson gave me that. And that grounded me a lot because I had asked him when he was doing Star Wars, how do you, how do you not get overwhelmed by the bigness, uh, of all of it. And he said, no matter how much money you have, you have to tell a good story first. And I felt like, I feel like I know how to do that. So mm -hmm. let me let me focus on that. But what that more money gives you is more time and bigger toys. And it allows your, like your imagination to just go, whatever you kind of think about or want, it can happen. Whereas, you know, in a movie like Beyond the Lights, which was 7 million, it takes so much creativity. How, how can I recreate Glastonbury when I have, you know, no money or the BET awards? So you have to be really creative, but I did want to bring that same mentality to the old guard and not everything. I can just throw money at a problem. Let's, let's figure it out creatively. Um, you know, it's a reality though. I mean, there's pressure on every film with something like this and this much money. It, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of voices and there's, I think more fear because you don't want to disappoint anybody. You don't want people, especially your studio to look at it and say, well, what did we spend all that money for? Mm -hmm. um, you want to reward the people that took this leap of faith and trusted you. Um, you want 
to reward these actors who, who came into the genre, many who hadn't done the genre before, but wanted to do something different. Um, so that's that constant pressure. And I don't know, maybe it's me, maybe it's a female thing, you know, you want to please. But uh, I was grateful across the board for everyone who was involved in this. And I wanted to reward them uh, with a film that they were proud of. So that pressure was constant and the pressure of being a black woman and doing this and knowing how few have had this opportunity. I didn't want to mess it up for, you know, anybody else. I know what Patty Jenkins' success with Wonder Woman. I'm here because of that. She absolutely opened the door. And I thought about her a lot. The fact that she mm. achieved under such incredible pressure. And uh, so that was kind of my beacon throughout this as well. Mm. Uh, how do you navigate such pressure and fear? And do you have any advice for other artists and directors who have to deal with similar sort of pressures? Mm -hmm. It's a couple things. I mean, I, I certainly have a mantra to, you know, let my, my desire for success override, overcome my fear of failure. Um, I need to let that fear of failure drive me and, and not make me run away and hide. And it absolutely does. That fear of failure is what gets me on set um, first, work all day and have hyper focus, go home, watch dailies um, of the stuff I shot, then work on my shots. Uh, and then I have, you know, like 45 minutes of peace. And, and that's when I ate dinner and that it was a routine thing um, mm. that I created for myself, which I needed. I lived in a hotel for nine and a half months. I actually like hotels. Um, everyone thought I was crazy. Why don't you get a house? But I didn't want to think after you have to think so much throughout the entire day. You don't want to think. I didn't want to think about cleaning. I didn't want to think about <laughs> food. Um, so I would get there and I would order my room service and it was a ritual of it, the quietness of it, of a table coming in with a white tablecloth and the rose right in the center. It was like the sameness. Um, and I would order often <laughs> the same food, but it was, there was a calming to it. It was my, my quiet time. Um, and then I'd get a couple hours of sleep and, and do it again. Um, so creating routines for yourself, um, but also yeah, just being hyper-focused and and let that fear drive you as opposed to make you curl up in a ball. Mm, that's really good advice. Routines are definitely important. They've saved me. Um, one question we have, <laughs> uh, Gina, would you want to be considered to direct MCU's upcoming Blade movie? Um, <laughs> that's funny. I mean, Mahershala, I can't think of better casting. I'm sorry, I really can't. The, that is so perfect. Um, I, I am excited. That's a movie I wanna see. Um, I, I think it's dope. I'm so happy yet another black hero is gonna be put into the world. Um, and this, what we do, I love it so much. It's also incredibly hard. So I have to be gutterly passionate about the stories that I take on and the films mm. that I take on. And so there are movies that I want to do and movies that I have to do. And the have to's are the couple that I've done in my career, um, given that I need that passion to, to give 100% to be away from my kids and my husband. So Blade is something I'm gonna be first in line to watch, um, yeah. Perfectly diplomatic answer. I, I, it's all true, it's all true. <laughs> I loved it though. Um, Miles asks a good question. I love that in the old guard, we can easily follow the action set pieces in the film, which side note is way too rare in action films. Like, you know, some of these directors out there, I don't know what they're doing, but Miles continues, what were your film inspirations in crafting The Old Guard? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, before every movie, I, I, I watch a bunch of films in the genre and it's interesting to see the trajectory of action where you see where it changed and certainly Born Identity change the look of action, but then everyone was trying to copy it. Not everybody can do it well. And I think that's where we got into the stuff moving so fast and so much into cutting that you can't follow. And then it started John Wick, then brought mm -hmm. it back to the actors really doing it and you can see what's happening. And that's what excited me. The Raid is a, one of my templates. Absolutely love the action in that film. Um, the simplicity, the creativity, the rawness of it, um, that it wasn't 
ever, it didn't ever feel glamorized. Um, Mission Impossible, uh, MI6, the bathroom fight. That is a perfect, perfect action scene, perfect fight. That yeah. was definitely our template, um, certainly for the plane fight. I just, I love that you can follow the action, that it was telling us about the characters. And so I knew going in, that's what I wanted to do. Longer takes, um, not have to hyper edit to hide stunt people. So that meant I needed my actors to do the work so that they could really be doing these, these fights and scenes. And it's one thing to say that, but we found actors willing to put in the work. And I mean, Kiki, who had never done this before, that was two a days, five days a week for months to, to get there. And that was running training, um, boxing, weight training, um, gun training, <laughs> military <laughs> training, tactical training, <laughs> and then the choreography. So it was a lot, um, but that's, that's what it takes to be able to have the actors really do it so that I can pull the camera back and let an audience follow. So I'm, I'm you know, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you, Miles. Okay. Uh, we have a qu question from Kathleen. All films have friends and family screenings early on. What was the most valuable note that you took from the screening? That's a cool question. Yeah. Um, well, I had, I had a couple. There were a couple really important screenings. The first, and they're all scary. Um, <laughs> you know, the first screening um, was showing Greg Rucka. Mm. I wanted him, I needed him to love the film because we also worked so closely. It was such a great collaboration, such a great mutual respect. And he trusted me with these characters that he created. So um, to look when he, the movie, the lights came up and he sat there for a moment. I was like, Arr. and then he just turned with this um, enormous grin and just lifted me. And um, his, his thoughts were so good because he knows the characters better than anybody. So he gave me a couple really good trims actually, which focused um, some of the, you know, focused the dialogue and focused some of the emotional moments. Um, the second scary, screening was my two boys uh, because uh, they love me, of course, but they also are not shy to, <laughs> to speak their mind. And I did not want to hear that your, your action sucks, mom, or the action is corny, mom. Um, but they, they loved it. They gave me hugs at the end. So that was amazing. And they actually, they didn't, they didn't have a note. They had a note on one song that used to be in the movie that is not there anymore. So I trusted them on, on that. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the audience screenings that we had, those are horrifying <laughs> because now I've gone from the safety of friends and family to 250 people who do not care about me at all. Uh, didn't pay for it, no thing to walk out or say, you know, talk shit about the movie and they hated it. Um, but it was, that was amazing to get the reaction after all this time of, of working and, and believing in something, but not knowing fully if an audience was gonna embrace it or not. And it was, it was a magical screening, that first audience screening. And uh, I think the biggest, no, the biggest, the best note we got was in focusing on Niall and her, and her teammates essentially, um, understanding just focusing more on why why wouldn't they be so excited that she's alive um and just making it more clear that they're freaked out by the fact that she's still alive so um we actually trimmed that whole section terry and i which you know condensed it and and we feel you know really helped that that note awesome thank you for that answer um we have a question from Brittany. Uh, first, she says, I loved, loved, loved the movie. Each of the characters have a different relationship with faith and spirituality. Can you talk more about how you approach this in the story? That was, that was a big one. Um, definitely um, with Niall and Andy, there's a definitive difference. And given that, you know, so much of the story was their relationship. Um, it was something that, he, well, first that I brought into the script because I felt that Niall would be religious 
Um, and I thought it was a really important difference between her and a way to touch on the fact that Andy, who's 6,000 years old, all the different ways that religion, you know, shifted throughout, you know, decades and, and um, centuries. And the fact that she really was at one point thought of as a god because she couldn't die until she went underground. And, and so she would understand from her point of view that religion is BS. Mm -hmm. uh, she, for her, I know there's no God because people thought I was a God and I'm not a God. She's seen the way through centuries that religion has been poisoned or used um, in really dangerous ways and things that she's had to fight against. So her, her view of religion, you know, and, and God, she does not believe and she feels that she is right because she's seen um, that. Um, so I, I love that conflict between the two. I love that Niall, despite the fact of, of being so freaked out about what's going on, is relying on her faith to get her through this. And it is what keeps her asking why, whereas the old guard has stopped um, questioning why. Niall still believes there has to be a reason because of her faith in God, that there, there's always a reason. So that was, that was a really cool thing to ground the characters and, and certainly for Kiki that element of her character was something very important to her. Oh, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. Uh, from Kara Lee, how important is your onset vibe and how do you create and maintain it? Also, can you speak to how hard you fight for parody behind the camera? Two very different questions. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with parody. Um, this is the thing, you know, I would, we, so over half of my department heads on this were female. Um, mm -hmm. My post crew was 90% female. That doesn't happen in regular films. It, I don't think it's ever happened in an action film. My, they were, my post team was the dopest and their, like, their work was just so next level. My crew was just next level. Um, and I had great guys on it as well, but it was important for me to have women as well. And not because it's PC, but because I know that the shorter resumes that they have is not because of talent, it's because of opportunity. They have not been given the opportunity. And a lot of times not given the opportunity in films like this. So I've been given this opportunity. I'm absolutely gonna bring Terry Shropshire and Tammy Riker and um, had these great women, the, the head of my special effects, Haley Williams. I think she's the only female uh, the effects supervisor in the business and she, she is dope. Uh, and her energy was so great. When I met her, I said, I want that on set. My VFX supervisor, um, female, and her whole team was female. So that was, that's the other thing. When you, when you have a, a female at the head, a lot of times, a lot of their crew is going to be female as well. But our vis effects in this movie are, are great. And it was such a great collaboration. My music supervisor, Julie Michaels, female. Um, so, you know, costume. So it just, it, it's a good vibe. And um, these people are really good at what they do. They added to the film. They made me look good. So, again, when you're in this chair, and you have the opportunity to bring others with you, take it, take it as a responsibility, but also understand that you're getting really dope people, um, really dope artists. Um, the other question, why did I forget it? Oh, uh, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, I've always been like this, never too high, never too low. Um, I abhor screaming like I've never raised my voice on set. Um, it doesn't inspire people. It may scare people in the moment and then they start to resent you. I don't want that feeling on set. I want it to feel like a family. I want to inspire people to give me their best to help me um, realize my vision. And uh, one thing I've, I've learned I mean one I have a no asshole policy so I meet everybody. A lot of times your line producer will hire certain people just because, yeah, I, I, you know, in transpo and things like that. I want to meet everybody. Um, I want to know that I click with you. I want to know that you're a good person. Being really good at something and being an asshole 
being good is not worth it. Life is too short. It's too hard what we do to have that negativity, negative energy. And the other thing I learned early on in my career that I've kept up and um, it always amazes me when crews comment on it. Um, at the start of every day, I go around and I say hello to everybody. Um, at the end of the day, I go around, back in the day, I used to shake folks' hands. That's not happening anymore, but <laughs> I still go around and thank everybody um, at the end of the day because I'm grateful. Thank you for bringing your talent and your time to the set. Thank you for helping me. And um, it really does endear your crew to you because they, they see that you care about them um, you respect them. And it, uh, I think it creates a really good vibe. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. I think also having a no asshole policy is not only good for sets, but also good for life. No assholes. <laughs> um, we have a question from KP Stone. They ask, anything you learned from your experience directing the old guard that you will take into the woman king? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I feel like all my work, including the old guard, has got me into a position to be able to do the Woman King, which is, you know, pretty epic. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly the the importance um, with action of having a great crew around you. I, I thanked every day. I said to myself, I don't know where I would be if I did not have this level of crew with me on the action. They were just so good. Mm -hmm. and so collaborative and really the best the best um and i it makes you want to have the best around you for everything um but the action is so you have to have the right team it has to be collaborative they have to you know understand the vision and help you realize that vision through physicality telling the story through the physical um and i think i will take the fact that i got through a 63-day shoot um, the stamina that that takes, because you can't get sick, you can't just one day, yeah, I don't feel like going today. You can't ever not be prepared. Um, but I got through it and, and um, I will take that. That gives me more confidence and, and more swagger for, for the next one that once you've done it before, then you feel like, yeah, I can, I can kind of tackle anything. Oh, that's awesome. That's like, I can definitely feel that swagger and confidence. So. <laughs> So that's something I don't need to get on your level <laughs> that, on that note. Um, we have a question from Daniel Diaz. Um, he asks, how do you avoid the tropes that action movies fall prey to? And I'll also add on to that. Were there any tropes you were very cognizant of wanting to avoid? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's definitely um, being aware of those tropes and, and staying away from them. I think Greg's script, it starts with the script and Greg did not have tropes in there. I mean, I think the only trope, and I'm saying trope, but it, it didn't feel like that to me. And, and when I built on it, I didn't ever want it to feel simple, but I felt that Andy and Niall was the, the coolest veteran rookie kind of relationship that, that I had seen um, and wanted to really build on that. So I guess you could call that a trope, yet I felt we were coming at it uniquely. Um, I did not want, this to ever feel like white savior in terms of Andy and Niall. And it could have easily kind of fallen into that, but that's certainly a trope that, that I violently stayed away from. Mm. Um, so I, I think again, what was so great about this project and I think what you can see in action films that you love and action films that you don't is who wrote the script. I felt Greg, brought just this uniqueness that we hadn't seen. He stayed away from tropes and cliches. And uh, I, that's what I was so enthralled by, how different this felt. I think about Logan. Logan, I love that film so much. I love the fact that I cried in that. That's a great writer, James Mangold. And I felt he brought something really special and different to that film, Black Panther. Loved that film. Uh, and it felt so cultural and so different. And the fact that I cried when the villain died, like when does that happen? Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it's exciting to see where it's going, but also you look at, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, that's okay. Um, 
Let me turn this off. Yeah, it's uh, it's exciting um, when you see these these different writers coming in the, into this medium, and you your hope is that they don't people don't fall into the thing of oh we have to get an action writer to come in and punch it up and because what happens is they come in and they homogenize it and they put in tropes because that's what they're familiar with and we were able to you know really have Greg keep his his fist on this. Mm, definitely. Um, I think this is a really good question from Christina. Who do you call your mentors and how have they influenced and helped you on your journey? Well, I've had so many great people help me throughout my journey. I mean, it absolutely starts with my husband, Reggie Rock Bythewood. I am blessed and very lucky uh, to have not only someone who I think is you know, the best writer I know, um, but also someone who's been so supportive and believed in some of my things, sometimes more, you know, um, at times when I was falling apart and not thinking anybody was ever going to want to make Love and Basketball or Beyond the Lights. And he was always there pushing and believing. Um, and again, being able to share that talent to to be able to, you know, dive into a script and, and hear his thoughts and, and you know, just go back and forth and pound things out and make things better. Um, he has absolutely made me a better writer. And uh, I think my first gig in, in the business, A Different World, it was run by Susan Fales Hill and Debbie Allen, two black women. I got to go to work every day and that was my normal early on in my career. And Yvette Lee Bowser, who was a producer on that show, took me under her wing to show me the grind that you have to put in, that you have to make yourself invaluable. You need to, you know, do all nighters to make sure that your script is good. And, and I was right there with her. Um, they, they, like they, they protected me and pushed me and were absolutely instrumental um, in my career. Stan Lathan, uh, Sanaz Dad, um, such a great mentor, allowed me to really um, shadow him when he was on rock. So I could just see set dynamics, which is something that is not taught in film school. You're taught the technical, but being on set, you learn a lot, which is why, you know, I let people come shadow me because, you know, it's a, it's a great gift to be able to see it for yourself. Um, Casey Lemons, met her um, before I was going to do Love and Basketball and the way that she embraced me and gave me confidence. Uh, I've never forgotten that and absolutely have been focused on doing the same for others um, when I recognize talent and grit and hustle in them. And I know I'm forgetting other people, but um, those are those are the ones that definitely come to mind. Yeah, thank you for that answer. I think it's important for people to know that, you know, how important mentorship is. It's like, I definitely wouldn't be where I'm at without mentors. They're very important. And also not as easy to come by. It's kind of like you just have to meet the right person. <laughs> it's, at the right time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, here's another question. What was the biggest challenge that you faced while working on the film? Mm -hmm. I think it was being away. Um, my kids got to visit a couple times, but they're in high school now. And it's not like they're little kids and <laughs> you can pull them out of school. Um, being away. I mean, it is lonely. Um, I had the film to focus on and in some ways having, being on your own helps you laser focus, but it gets surreal to be away from your family, my husband, my boys for, for that long. Um, thank God for FaceTime because my earlier films didn't have FaceTime. It makes a difference that you can actually see them, talk to them that way. Um, but I would, <laughs> Um, my son plays baseball, my younger son, and I would, uh, I would be up. It was idiotic, but I was so compelled. You know, he would have baseball games during the week, and there was an app where I could watch. I couldn't see video, but you could see, you know, if he got a hit, the little person, the little Chiron would, would move around the bases. And I'm watching these at 2, 3 in the morning because of the time difference, but I knew I was going to be wrecked the next day uh, on set, but I couldn't help it. I needed to be a part of his life in that way and be connected. Um, so that was the toughest part. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we have a question from Kay Barnes. Is there any must know advice that you can give to a new female action thriller director, especially when it comes to directing female leads? Mm -hmm. um, you know, absolutely watch films that you respect and, and love because you can learn a lot from that. Um, you can build your craft that way. Both, in, but actually, honestly, watch movies that you don't think are very good because seeing stuff you don't want to do is as valuable seeing stuff that you'd like to emulate or expand on. Um, and also for me, I think what's so important is to, when you're doing an action film with females, um, don't think about it as interchangeable. Don't think, don't create an action scene that you would think, oh, well, men could do this too. You know, let's make it like, like a male scene. I mean, in the plane fight, these characters, they're not strong enough. They're not going to pick each other up and throw them against the wall, yeah. you know, um, because we don't have that type of strength, but we have other strengths. So be true to the characters, let them be women. And that doesn't mean they're any weaker. It doesn't mean they're any less courageous or badass. We just fight differently. Um, and focus for me, it was important. Let me focus on the athleticism and the skill. I never wanted to make it feel sexual. Mm. These women are fighting um, and, and, you know, let them be badass in this, in that way. Uh, our fights do not have to be sensual or sexual. Um, you know, someone made the joke, but it was true that they were happy that, you know, that somebody's shirt didn't suddenly come off in the middle of the fight. Um, you know, certainly don't want that. So let your characters be female, um, but also make sure that your actresses put in the work to look good. There's two tells, two tells with women uh, in terms of action and athletics, uh, how they throw a punch and how they run. Those two things will kill you in a heartbeat if they can't do it. So as I said, Kiki took boxing to, to learn how to throw a punch and I put her with a running coach so that she could look good running. That's important. I know I look awkward when. 